Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian. And I'm Ethan. And we have a 75-point battle report for you. I ended up uh, going with Grimkin this time. I uh, had a pairing set out for me, and based on what Ethan had presented, I had to choose between my child list with a bunch of heavies and gremlin swarms and death knell in uh, Dark Menagerie, or I had to go with uh, Old Witch 3. So I chose Old Witch 3 because there was a, a good amount of armor that needed to be broken, but uh, the list didn't seem like it wanted to be or wanted to have all your armor cracking condensed into like war beasts that you kind of wanted to spread it out a little bit so my list is a clockatrice a cage rager and a fright mare and that one's in there just so i can get eyeless sight on old witch uh i have my two trapperkin requisitions i think it's one of the best requisitions in the theme it really, i love trapperkin so much they're cool other than that, the rest of this list looks pretty normal to what you'd expect from a bump in the night list. It's double grave ghoul, double nay slayers with the twilight sisters and the unit attachment for the slayers, double malady man, double madcaps. And the thing that I'm changing up a little bit is uh, I've decided to bring Eilish Garrity and Lord Longfellow. Eilish is really there because I've been in brawl machine mode lately and I like to have the upkeep removal so it doesn't just like get me out of nowhere. So he's in this list and then Lord Longfellow's in because there there's definitely more characters in the game these days and I felt like maybe I could get a chance to utilize some of his cool uh, damage potential into characters to try and, you know, justify his inclusion. So then this week I'm rocking the cock and I got... I had two Clockwork Legion lists. I had one with Orion, which was really super shooty. Had like perforators, only four Tessellators, because that's his min battle group points. But like, it was all the guns, really cool. And then I saw Old Witch was in the pairing, and I was like, that's not a fun time. So I opted going for my Lucant list, which it does have a Prime Axiom, so Windstorm can affect a little bit. But I like to play the Prime Axiom as more of like a second wave piece anyway with Lucant. So I figured it'd be fine. And Lucant, my battle group, is a Prime Axiom. And then thanks to Clockwork Legions, I get a free Corollary and a free Diffuser as my rec options. And free Lights just feel really good, especially with Lucant having Field Marshal Shield Guard. And then my last rec option is for James, because uh, I feel like with Positive Charge and Feet, she can actually get some work done. And then I got an ADO, Double Void Archon, uh, two units of Eradicators, and then, of course, of course, Gatsby 4 with a Scavenger. Just because he does so much for Clockwork Legions. Yeah, he's like the model now that Convergence will take always and forever. Yes. So thanks to my re-roll, I got to go first. I think I rolled a 3D or 4 first, and then I chucked the dice again and got a, got a 5. So yeah. that felt spiffy. It was stupid. I so, hate it. <laughs> so it took me a while to set up the... The thing about this, I, I really just need to sit down and play this Grimkin list like five times. Like, there's there's just so many layers that need to be stacked, and and the positioning is really important to setting up this list. Thankfully, I was able to kind of deploy pretty aggressively with the Madcaps and not keep them back for the stumbling drunk play dead business. Um, Ethan's shooting doesn't really threat as far as I as it as it could on turn one to start catching my. Uh, um, my naysayers, so I can just kind of run them up without having to worry about it so much. Uh, the first thing that ends up happening here is the Trapperkin gets into the zone and then buries or goes into his little trapdoor thing, and then Old Witch uh, Boundless charges herself, uh, puts up Windstorm. No, she didn't put up Windstorm. She did something else with her focus this turn. Uh, put up Respawn. And then uh, just charged forward to get uh, just barely into that zone. And then the madcaps start uh, cooking cask imps on the bottom. They only crack one. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the other madcaps up top end up dropping two more cask imps. And uh, that is... I feel like going over the wall is a decent place for them. So the uh, the second Trapperkin ends up going up and burying in that zone as well. This way I can kind of get a chance to maybe unpack them uh, later and be safe from the shooting. Uh, just get some cool charges. Next up, I get to position my Nayslayers. And they're just uh, running as far as they can. I think the, the rock in the middle is kind of harsh in my chill with uh, the positioning on these guys. I think it's not great for Ethan, but it's more 
detrimental to me uh, because my naysayers are kind of that that whole top side of the board is really sectioned to that portion and isn't going to be able to kind of curve around a lot uh, like I would want them to. So hopefully I can just manage that top zone with that portion of my army. It's like it's weird playing this list. It almost feels like you're playing two mini armies instead of playing one full one since it's so symmetrical. And with the way this scenario is uh, invasion, we can kind of see that play out with the way that it's split. Like everything is just influencing its own little zone. It's kind of cool. So turn one, I just got to move up the board and respect his threat ranges. He doesn't threaten quite far enough for me to have to worry about feeding bottom one, especially with the cloud wall right there in the middle and the burning earth. And I have some plans with Gatsby to extend that off a little bit so I can get up the board and be a little safe. Uh, so Nayslayers with the Desperate Pace threaten 13, 15 if Old Witch Boundless charges. So I'm leaving stuff within 15 on the edges for now until I put down a cloud potentially just so that way if he wants to boundless charge he's either a gonna have to go wide with uh, old witch or pop one of her other abilities besides the plus four inch for her stupid 18 inch windstorm bubble uh, so the voyage just stays back to be completely safe uh, the eradicators did arms up so they get plus one arm for each of their bucklers so they go up to arm 17 uh, there uh, Gatsby flickers forward because he wants to walk and then he walks six, so now I'm eight inches up, and I'm in range to drop a cloud on the other side of the burning earth. So now those eradicators aren't getting charged by anything, so now they're able to just be up the board and be safe. Uh, his scavenger that powered up runs not its full 14, just behind the burning earth. That way it can walk and threaten everywhere. Diffuser runs 10. My ADO runs up just to stay out of the way. Uh, mostly the ADO is here so I can channel a positive charge onto the scavenger. Uh, because with positive charge and the eradicators doing their plus two to hit ability, they go up to effectively mat 11, which is pretty legit. I feel like it gives the list a lot of options. And with finisher, they can still crack armor. And the positive charge and dark shroud gets them up to power 16 finishers. So I think that's pretty neat for the list. That's why I wanted to try out eradicators. This is my first time playing Clockworks. Uh, since the Oblivion update, and I always used to play Reciprocators. Yep, Reciprocators. That's what I was going to say, too, but you, you beat me to it. The Reciprocators usually seemed really good to stack the, the damage and the armor, but Eradicators seem to get there all right, too. Yeah, they're pretty good, and at least they get the... They're the same arm as a Reciprocators base when they do the plus two, and then they don't have to worry about Shield Wall. Yeah, Shield Wall can get a little clunky. Yeah, like if maybe they had a mini feat to get their defensive like, formation would be the many feet they'd want yep so the prime axiom couldn't run the full distance uh, i'm i did some focus juggling i think i allocated one put up watcher put up decel because i'm not worried about getting killed because the only thing that can get to me is a witch and one clock spray and man big daddy lucant is tanky uh, i put up a void behind the building outside 13 inches of the ponies So the it's worth mentioning at least right now that my objective for the game is going to be the Isla site. I know I have Isla site with the uh, the Frightmare on Old Witch, but um, this way I can kind of save myself some fury and uh, also put it on things that might uh, might uh, be better served than just Old Witch. Because right now it's just the Old Witch and the Frightmare that can get it, so it's nice to and have the it. Clock on has a base. Else. Yeah, base base Isla's. Yeah. Uh, mine's treasure chest for what it's worth too. Yeah, the uh, um, the trapperkin on the in the middle zone pops up. I have a feeling that I want to try and go after James with that one and just get her gone. Yeah, because I did leave James in range to she had line of sight to the objective, so I wanted like I didn't tuck her all the way in because I wanted her to be able to charge it next turn. And then my second trapperkin, the one in that circle zone, ended up popping up, and he's got range to get on that void. So I was super happy to be able to kind of spring this trap. Yeah, um, I didn't even think about the Trapperkin. I measured the 13 <laughs> on the ponies, and it's, the Trapperkins always get me. I forget they can pop up farther than their actual token. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get to come up within three, and then they charge 10 and ten inches, so they threaten 13 and a half from where they are. So if you even get close to that zone, you're just going to get zapped by them. And you left it on one. I did. I, I rolled pretty nice with the Trapperkin. I would have liked Oof. to have taken it out completely, but leaving it on one is decent. I've got some uh, chances to try and take it out otherwise, like... 
Uh, so I'm not completely bereft of any kind of ability. to. I want to get rid of the voids because like the void archon is just the bane of my existence. I am not really the greatest when it comes to positioning. I'm sure you've seen many of my anti-Malvin and Mayhem rants and examples because I don't position the greatest. But void archons just get me on a whole nother level. So I wanted to make sure that that one is gone because I feel like of all the things in your army, it is the most threatening thing to everything I've got. Yeah, it can get in some weird, funky places for sprays. And it's also worth noting the cast imp up on top was an inch short of getting on the void. You rolled a four when you needed a five. Yep, I needed that five to get in there and just couldn't couldn't quite get it. But uh, you, you, you fail every cast imp alcohol-fueled thing you don't take. And here you did the charge on the trapper kid, and I procced Watcher. Yeah, now you get to play the tricky traps. Yep, my POW 7 bash. With just, a diffuser. Just him. <laughs> yep, just smoked him. So that was unfortunate. Uh, I would have liked to have been able to get into James Prefeet, but, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I, I just uh, had forgotten that Watcher had gone up, and uh, that was my mistake. So next up, uh, I tried the other Cask Imp, and he was going for a long bomb too and stopped a little short. Um, I don't think I had the ability. I would have had the ability to get in, maybe? No, I, maybe I didn't have it. I was just going for it to go for it. Um, so he ends up going up and, and not quite getting there. So now I've got to try and figure out how I'm going to kind of come back from all of this. So I think the Frightmare, and not that I'm, you know, down. I just had a, had a plan that didn't work out. So the Frightmare ends up boosting a shot into the uh, Diffuser, which gets shield guarded to the Prime Axiom. And I knew that that was going to happen when this came up, but I figured I'd just take the opportunity to throw it out there. Um, next up, I think it's mostly just kind of positioning things, because I realize now, like... Given where James and Gatsby are, uh, the one tech piece that I've brought to try and help me deal with them is not anywhere near my uh, eyeless sight objective. So I think Longfellow is going to end up winging around the side, at least eventually. Maybe I'm just getting too far ahead of myself. I think the, the big thing is this is a long turn for me. And not a whole lot's getting done here. It's pre-feet for Ethan, so there's not... A, I'm trying to... I feel like I'm under the wire to kind of get work done before that feat goes up because I know that when he feats, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for me to do things because most of my armor cracking comes from armor piercing. So when you're layering the buffs of the feat, uh, it's, it's really not looking great for my ability to kind of break through your stuff. So I decide to uh, sacrifice the... Uh, the the cask imp and trapper kin for the greater good over here and uh i charge the uh the um void archon that's behind that building i had the line to it and i'm able to get around that obstruction no problem so i boost the hit and boost the damage on uh the archon i, I connect and then after boosting damage i end up ripping it off the table yep even with dsl with only one box left a dice minus uh seven yeah so i got a little bit on the lucky side with that one especially with the trapperkin doing so much work for me but uh i'm feeling pretty good about that side being more controllable for me because there's that house in the top corner and that's kind of guiding where ethan's stuff can and can't go you can see that there are some eradicators kind of stuck behind the building and it's really just my goal to not try and proc any vengeance moves to make sure that um they don't wrap around the building and get better charges. So not putting the Clockatrice into that perfect line of eradicator damage was probably a, a good deal for me. Yeah, and I was really hoping on the Void to help clear that zone because once he gets in the Nayslayers, like, his sprays do work. He needs uh, sevens, but if he can get it in the rear arc, just fives, like, yep. he can do some work. And you can see my, my now now positioning that I don't care about your Voids being a thing of the perfect line of Nayslayers up top. The Malady Man hasn't been doing much for Desperate Pace or anything like that. I think it's taking Ethan maybe... A, it's going to take Ethan a little bit longer to get into my zone, and that Clockatrice there is going to be something for him to mess with. So I can just kind of play coy with the Nayslayers and unpack them later. I think... It's also worth noting that uh, James prayed the clock because she's one of the only three sources of Grievous I have in the list. Yep, and, and with him having auto repair, it's important. And with <laughs> Stutter... The big thing is respawn. Yeah. And when you killed the void, I now have zero ways of killing the uh, cockatrice up there because even it will just stutter away outside my half inch melee. And then even if I do kill it, it will respawn three inches outside my half inch melee. 
So like that's a big hit to that side. There was my wasted turn of the the long fellow running around to kind of get in range of that objective, so I can try and put some damage onto Gatsby and James. Maybe um, finisher plus fortune fortune hunter is is really cool for him. Uh, he's expensive, but it might be. I don't know. He's. I feel like he's a good tech piece, but I just don't know if he quite gets there in this list. Six points is a lot when you consider the type of support and, and work you can get from just the heavies in this list. Mm -hmm. And then here I think we're talking about how my Prime Axiom threatens 14 inches, and you were going to shoot your gun, and I was like, all my stuff's constructs except the ADO, so all you do is plunk a cloud in front of me. Yeah, so the, I end up having to use Old Witch to just get out of uh, out of threat range of the Prime Axiom, and I, I haven't left a lot in this zone to keep it safe, though. So at the bottom of two, I'm 100% feeding this turn because I know he's going to be getting into me, and with the armor-piercing lances, uh, I want to get the plus six armor effectively because the shield's up, so the... The Eradicators are armed 15 base, so they go down to armor piercing 8, uh, but then plus 6 from their 2 bucklers and plus 4 from feet mean that Nayslayers are dice off 7, and they have 8 boxes, so I'm kind of survivable. Uh, there, I'm just trying to measure if I can maybe clear that cast Gimp out of my way, and then that way I can maybe engineer like 1 charge on the clock or just get some early damage on it just so I can proc finisher for later turns. I know it auto heals, but I'm just hoping to do more. Uh, there, that was me pre-measuring the scavenger walking. I just wanted to make sure I couldn't get all three of them with this half-inch little bite. Uh, so he has to pick two of the three. So I'm debating on like loading him up. And this is just me spending a few minutes at the beginning of my turn determining allocations, determining lines, where I want to go. Because I want Gatsby to get a couple souls. Because I'm thinking about using... The murder bots to get a soul but i also want the void archon they have a charge target that way it can teleport eight inches back there get a sweet spray down maybe kill the malady man before the re-rolls become a problem uh, grave ghoul you mean grave ghoul and even like even possibly killing the malady man just to get rid of the monkey because i think this is me asking you if the monkey goes away when the malady man dies yeah from what i see on the card the monkey sticks around as if the malady man dies they're not like they don't have like this weird attached rule or anything like that. They're just a unit that's comprised of Malady Man plus Monkey. Yeah. So the Monkey will stick, but he won't come back anymore because the 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 Malady Man's not around. Mm -hmm. So I have one focus on the Corollary. So I believe I'm going to be allocating one to the Diffuser because with Windstorm up, because he did Windstorm, the poor Diffuser is down to range six, but he can still walk to get range to the objective. And I just... I give out a focus that way I can boost it. I know it's lucky in Rat 3, so not snakes, but that way I can induct back to the Prime Axiom anyway, so it's like a free focus for him because the Corlayer is going to activate next to Lucant, go up to 2, fuel the Prime Axiom up to 2, and then the Diffuser will induct to the Prime Axiom for 3. I really like induction chains with the Prime Axiom. It's just so fun. It's, yeah, it's in, way easier. Too. Induction in general is probably the coolest mechanic they've done. Like... Essence is, is busted, but uh, induction just is really neat. It takes a lot of planning to make it work, and it feels like just a good mechanic in general. Mm -hmm. And then like with a huge base, it's so much easier to induct back to the corollary. Especially now with the ADO doing what it does. So Scavenger walked up, fully loaded, boosted the hit, needed the six, <laughs> missed, bought an attack, missed, bought an attack, finally hit, so a three-focus light killed one dude. Yeah, I was, that was I was just I wanted to do two boosted sixes for nearly auto kills, but that's not a thing. Yeah, it just didn't come together for that little uh that little scavenger. Yep. So Gatsby's sitting there. Uh here I'm trying to be cute and measure if I run, can I get a murder bot on the objective? Because I'm like planning on James charging it. Cause uh, I figured with Beacon and Flare, I'm still on the fence about selling the Prime Axiom. I like to have him be a second wave. But I think, like, partway through this turn, I realized, like, he's got nothing in the middle that can threaten the Prime Axiom. So if I bury that under feet, it's going to be a real good time. Uh, so Murderbot, I think Gatsby just tucked behind the clouds. Murderbot went up onto the monkey and missed. Needed a boosted nine. So I've missed a boosted six and a boosted six and a boosted nine. So now the Void, he charges to there. Punches the Cask Imp. Trivially kills it. Gets a soul. Teleports eight, gets melee range on the 
uh, Malady Man, the Grave Ghoul, and Malady. Yeah, Man. yeah, both. And here I get really cute, and I target a spray all the way across the board at that Cage Rager because he's just like downtown. Yeah, and, and spraying that him lines it up to where you end up getting the three things that the scavenger was trying to get into. Mm-hmm. But I think right now you're punching on the Malady Man, and yep. it doesn't take much to get him gone with Dark Shroud. Yeah, I needed a four to kill, so there I'm targeting the. Uh, like I said, the Cage Rager, so that gets me those three. I need sevens. Uh, he opts to reroll that one. I miss. Hits the second one and hits the third one. So now I go up to three souls. I'd I'd hoped to clear the zone this turn too, uh, but I'd hoped that the Void would be able to kill those three back there. And now I'm just measuring to make sure I can charge without going through the Burning Earth because I don't have Pathfinder because I don't have a Optifix Directive in this list. Uh, with the Double Voids and Gatsby, like... The points get eaten up real fast. Yeah, there's very, very minimal points for support. But they're pretty much an auto-include in Clockwork, so you do what you do. Uh, so there, I charge, so that way I'm within two and a half of the back pony. That's that the void failed to kill and then I get a couple charges and then I run because they're doing shields up so they're mat seven so they need sixes hits pow 12 finisher he sidesteps just a little forward hits him and now I can sidestep forward and get my half inch on that pony and I miss so like I can't clear that zone this turn but I'm set in a good spot for next turn. And that's why I deployed Gatsby down towards that zone. Because I noticed your heavies were on the other side of the board. And once Gatsby gets in that zone, there's really nothing that threatens him outside Nayslayer charges. But I can body block him effectively. Uh, Diffuser boosts the shot. So now the objective is beaconed. And it inducts it back to the uh, Primaxium. So now I'm just making sure that the Primaxium can charge before Lucant has to go, because I want Lucant to shift down towards the bottom objective to make sure I keep the Void in control. So we're just measuring lines. It's hard to see Big Daddy's like spider legs, but I'm able to clear him and go there. So Corollary goes, or the Corollary is going to go, and then I opt to like measure if I can stay within nine inches of the back of that base which I can, I can stay in the Prime Axiom's rear arc so I'm not blocking his charge and be within nine of the, where the base is gonna be uh, because nine inches is what induction range is when the ADO is within five. So ADO runs up to stay, I wanna say he's gonna tuck behind the cloud, but I decide to do James first because she charges the objective because it's beaconed, so I can definitely get there. Hits it, does a couple points of damage, and then I redirect my second attack into the Frightmare. Frightmare. So I'm not expecting to kill it, but I feel like this is my opportunity to get some damage and bury James on my feet terms to try and get spring loaded to work. Because uh, every time you hit her and don't kill her, you take D3 damage. And I feel like Lucant is one of the few places where that's going to come up. Yeah, for sure. She gets she gets decent defense, great armor, and the Prime Axiom ends up over killing the objective by a ton. So you're kind of like sitting here with focus you can't do much with. Yep, so I could buy an attack into James in the butt and hope I miss. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't seem like a good idea, so the corollary is just going to be stuck. Uh, Lucant walks up to stay within three, and I get my 16 to the void. I feet. Uh, the three is mostly so that way the corollary can activate next turn and get to another focus, just to try and save my focus economy, and I put up D-cell. I'm debating putting out a dissolution bolt, and I think... I opt to because I don't think anything threatens me. And then I decide, like, I think I keep going back and forth and I, I decide think we were, just to camp it. We were talking about threat ranges and the clock can get on to you from here if I get boundless on it. So I think that was that that made you think that you wanted to keep uh, Lucant uh, camping focus. Yep. Because for him to get boundless, he'd have to feet, walk up there. And he'd have to get a landing zone. I'm playing on putting Eradicators in the way. So he'd probably take a bunch of free strikes. Uh, but I decided to just play it safe and don't lose. So then Eradicators up top are just walking. So I can walk a couple in the zone. Going to be basically Vengeance Triggers. Then a couple of them are walking to block landing spots for the, the bird. I punch the bird. I hit. Pow 12. Does a three points which procs finisher for my second swing uh, which hits 
and then dice minus six finisher rolls an eight. That's yeah, so that was that was good for me. Yeah, I was hoping to just do something. So the the dreaded Lucant feet turn came around, and I, I know the clock isn't in view right now, but that first turn that I took sunk up like thirty minutes. The first two turns sunk up like thirty minutes of my time, so I think I might be sitting like at thirty six or something like that. I think you were down to about forty ish. It was somewhere between forty and thirty five for sure. But uh, it's not looking great for me on clock management right now. There's just a lot to unpack with this list. And now I've got uh, opportunities to take attacks into things. And that bottom zone is looking like it's collapsing pretty hard, mostly due to the Void Archon over there. I've got ways to kind of bolster it back up. But once the Void gets in, it's hard to get out. And Ethan is right. My, my deployment for the heavies wasn't the greatest in that I don't have anything over there to really deal with Gatsby. So I think I end up starting out trying to figure out how to get rid of James because I do want to get the something. And I'm thinking that maybe I can get the Cage Rager into the Prime Axiom, which I've kind of proxied out already. And I, I decide to back out the Frightmare. It takes a free strike. He's got his mind and his spirit up, which are the only two systems I really need. On four dice, that roll was abysmal. <laughs> it like, was, it, I there was a chance lucky. I could have killed it with the free strike, <laughs> and instead I rolled like a five, a one, and the one, and the two. Yep, I got super lucky with that one. So the, 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 the great machine goddess is not with you today. Um, so the, uh, the, the Frightmare ends up taking a shot, and I connect. And when we were figuring out the damage right away, I think we ended up doing one point to her. But then uh, we realized that I ended up missing yep, instead we, of connecting. I think it was missing by one or two or something. You missed by two. Oh, because of Blade Shield. Yep, because we both forgot she had Blade Shield. And I was like, wait, Blade Shield? Yep, she's like a clockwork angel plus shield thing. What are they called? Steel Soul, Protector. Steel Soul Protector. Yep. Yeah. I was going to call them Shield Maidens because that's basically what they kind of are, but not really. And with D-Cell and Feet, she's armor 23 against shooting with yep. eight boxes. Mostly, the big goal for me here was to just try and get Finisher to work. So I'm digging deep on, on this and going with Eilish to shoot a bleed into her. He takes three damage for it, and he comes up short by three of doing enough to, to throw damage at her. He's dice off 13. Yeah, he needed a 14. Yeah, he needed a 14. So he's four dice short, which I don't think, think I've even rolled yet. So I'm jumping the gun a little bit. No, like, I think he just teleported backwards. Yeah, so it must have happened already. Yeah, you're so just he, deep in the tank trying yeah, to get he, that one point. I need something. I just want to really make... I want to, like... I want to justify the existence of <laughs> Lord Longfellow in this list so bad. And the worst place to do that is on my feet. Turn yep, with it's D-cell. just so bad. So I even I even go deep with the Twilight Sisters, and I'm just like, it's, if I roll box cars, I get one. So uh, I don't do it with those ladies either. So it truly is just the the worst worst of times because I can't even like have Old Witch go up and start punking on it because like she. It, I'm probably not going to get anywhere near close to killing the Prime Axiom this turn, but I need to get something in between me and that big guy so I don't just like easily give Ethan my caster. And now since Lord Longfellow's in the position that he's at, which now I've moved him out of the way, um, he's trying to take his shots into James. Uh, now he's kind of aligned himself so she's not getting cover from that obstruction. And uh, we end up connecting. Connecting against her is not difficult with him. And we end up doing a couple damage here and there. Like Lord Longfellow rolled a little high. Um, just without the without the uh, finisher proc'd right away, there was really no chance of me grabbing her. Yeah, you did three damage to her, so she's sitting on five. Yeah, it's unfortunate that that couldn't happen. Like I said, I really wanted to make Long Longfellow feel like his inclusion was justified here. But just based on the way things kind of transpired up there, it just wasn't. It didn't work. And so. she's in the way of that proxy base for the cage rager to charge the prime axiom. Yep, and that's that's what I was trying. I was kind of set trying to set up this like curse of shadows, boundless charge on the cage rager play to try and put some damage onto the prime axiom because you don't have any repair elements in here. So um, now we get to go to the fun stuff of me activating my uh, cask imp. And I first thought I could back him out like normal and then realize that I can't do that. You have to do the little alcohol-fueled thing right away. And I rolled a stupid six. 
and the positioning on that one took out three Nayslayers, all of my cast Gimps, and my Madcap boss. I only killed two Nayslayers. It was so bad. <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> it killed five models, six yeah. including itself. It was really, really not good. And that's the zone that I'm like most poised to take control of this turn. So losing all those Nayslayers was just not good. So this is just another example of like me really needing to play this list a lot more to to like mitigate some of these problems. Like it's a one in six chance, right, that that happens. But I, so much was relying on me clearing this top zone. Like there's only two Eradicators that are on the edge of it and then one that's in the middle. So like between the Clockatrice and the Nayslayers, they're dice off seven or the, the Nay Slayers are dice off seven with the feet turn, so it's not looking great for them, but they could have been able to put some damage out there and get these Eradicators gone, but I really needed more Nay Slayers to make this happen. So um, the Warhorse and the couple that are that are hanging around, they end up putting their uh, Slippery Order, or not Slippery, but they, they get Parry and, and stuff. So they, they get that, they go through, they kill one Eradicator, and the other one on the top there, or probably closer to the side, uh, is sitting fine. I think I might have got one Nayslayer into him. You, did, you got one Nayslayer into the right one, and you did three damage, I believe. So he's on five as well. Yep. So I've, I'm hoping that this monkey can do some stuff, but I ended up trying to do something else that I haven't done before. And instead of putting up the killing spree thing on the monkey, I decided to put up Cradle Song because, you know, stationary infantry is nice to mess with every now and again but uh the monkey charged off and was like i guess if i roll super high do some damage but he he of course didn't do anything so that was just me not really not really taking the best efficient action up there it's also worth noting cradle song is living only god damn it i just looked it up i was like something seems weird about this play so then i guess i can't lull the machines to sleep this is another example of why i need to play this more so um the old witch activates and I kind of do things out of order here. I feet and then I decide to do the, the hell, the hell something or other the hell hole hell hole. I bring back a couple, uh, naysayers into the bottom zone. I figure that can help me balance out the, the ones that I've lost. So now that unit's back to full and, uh, the the feat is going to get me everything I kind of want this turn. I'm getting Curse of Shadows on the Prime Axiom. I'm getting Boundless Charge on the Cage Rager. I'm able to get Windstorm up if I wanted, but I didn't. I didn't put Windstorm up. I kind of wanted the bigger control range because that Clockatrice is pretty far from me, and I want him to dig a little deeper. Uh, and this way I just can do everything I want and still have some focus hanging around. So that's where I'm at. I'm camping three right now, and I've kind of given up on Operation Go After the Prime Axiom and have decided to just put the Cage Rager into James. Uh, the first attack hits, and uh, we end up uh, doing not a lot of damage right away. So then I reroll with the Malady Man and uh, Crusher. <laughs> so all of that work to try and manufacture this thing has just kind of turned into me killing James with a 17-point heavy. But now it stops the Prime Axiom from just trivially killing Old Witch next turn. It does. I still wanted just a little bit of damage into him. I figured at dice off four. I, I can't kill the Prime Axiom, but I thought that I could do dice enough. Dice off to, five. Dice off five, sorry. I thought I could do enough damage to maybe like cripple a side down or something. So now up top here, the, the Clockatrice is going into the Eradicators and has a little bit of a problem with taking them down with his tail. Uh, so he ends up. Uh, getting one Eradicator out and putting a little bit of damage on the other one with his claws, but it's not enough to clear the zone, and I have nothing in the tank to take out that top Eradicator, which is the only stupid model stopping me from scoring that zone. And I really wanted to try and get some momentum on the scenario here, but I just couldn't get that Eradicator because I blew up all my stupid Nayslayers. So with nothing left in that top zone to really do, I end up moving down to the bottom zone. And uh, this one's a little bit, like, less... It's not less difficult. There's less that I can, can do here, really. So I put up my little slippery horse order, and uh, these guys are able to parry through and get their three-inch charges onto eradicators. Again, it's still dice off seven with these guys, and maybe the better idea would have been to like get Curse of Shadows out on one of these eradicator units, maybe the bottom one, to try and take them out a little bit easier. Uh, 
you know that that probably was the better call here but the uh war horse is able to get in on the void archon and i figure if i can get the void archon out of here that just means it's one less thing i need to deal with and uh it'll be maybe slightly more difficult for ethan to deal with the zone on top especially with the twilight sisters hanging out back there um i think i've got the the naysayers on the side that just came in i should have moved these guys around a little bit but at least they're back far enough to where like maybe they can stick around because honestly, I probably should have just moved them backwards to make sure that we could get some more back in play if uh, the the top ones went down. Yep. So the uh, the Nayslayer War Horse ends up crushing the the Void Archon, which I'm super happy about. And I think one Eradicator went down with all that. Uh, and I didn't get to do anything into the uh, the the Scavenger. And then I think I shuffle up the 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 Nayslayers just a wee bit. Uh, we get some cast gimps out just to kind of. I don't know what I'm, do what I plan on doing with them over here. I just didn't want to blow up on my own guys again. Yep. So it, you can't see the clock, but I have a pretty big clock advantage. I want to say about I'm 15. Probably, I gotta minutes. be sub 20, 10 minutes by now. You are. I believe you're at nine minutes, and I'm at like about twenty. Yeah, it's not looking great. I thought I, I, I started off the game with having the ca the clock in the camera, but then I moved it around because I was getting the Mally. Invasion is just a hard one to keep track of because it's either you get to see the clock and see all the garbage that's on our side of the table, which <laughs> is honestly most of Ethan's stuff. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I'm a like I'm a hot mess when it comes to tokens and stuff. There, I'm just doing my vengeance swings. I miss on the bottom one, that guy that went into the pony next to the burning earth. So that was fun. The top one, I'm like, do I go for a bird? Uh, so that one, vengeance is around to stay within reach of the bird. The rest are just going up. I believe he punches a a, a monkey. Yeah, a monkey. No, he punches the naysayer. Oh yeah, because we were asking about defense, and we're like, yeah, he's one less. Yep, because he needs a six. Hits it. Monkey. Yep, and I think my Grave Ghoul is in range to get that corpse, so I'm happy that that Grave Ghoul is functioning. The one on the bottom doesn't really have any corpses, though. Yep. So here I'm debating, like, do I upkeep Watcher? Because normally when I run Watcher, or a Prime Axiom with Lucant, uh, Lucant is butt-hugging that Prime Axiom, because if you don't know, with Watcher, if you're base-to-base -base with a Colossal, it's slightly less than 5 inches. So any one inch melee heavy that goes anywhere into that colossal takes a watcher punch and a watcher punch from a prime axiom is boosted pow 21 fully boosted. Yeah, it hurts. So especially like, since he's base mat seven with Lucant. Yep. Uh, so uh, base mat six. Oh, I thought for Axis some reason he seven. was seven. He's six because he has positive charge. I've been looking at Aurora two too much. Yep. She is seven. Uh, so here I decide to drop watcher. I allocate one to the prime axiom. Uh, so, or no, I, I give one to the diffuser. Yeah, the diffuser, because you're going to transfer back to the Primax. Yeah, because yep, he's going to walk over and boost a punch into somebody to try and kill. Uh, I poop out a servitor with Gatsby. Yeah, I think this is... Is this the first? No, you don't. You've you've forgotten to gra grab servitors with the prime axiom. Yeah, I have not pooped one out every turn because I keep forgetting. I always in my head. I'm like I'm still in the mindset of it's during its activation, but it is now in the control phase. Yeah, maintenance it's, phase. it's been a while since he played convergence. So I believe this is the turn where I do poop one out. You can't see it behind him. It's a flare bot, accretion servitor. Yes, and that's what actually is activating. It walks up, staying outside reach, staying out half inch of the. The Nayslayers throws a flare bomb at the bird just to be annoying in the zone in case I can get some attacks into it. It misses, but with an AoE 3 and me being that close, it can't drift off, which is fun stuff. And now here's going to be some super fun stuff for me. I'm measuring Gatsby's <laughs> walk threat. So he walks 6, has reach, so I can walk up basically to where the scavenger is standing and get about 5 dudes in my melee range. So scavenger walks up, punches the the casket pot. I can't remember its name. The madcap mad boss. Madcap boss punches it, boosts damage, 
Pow 13 with Dark Shroud kills it, and now we flip to you for the explosion. Yeah, I get to sit here and figure this one out because, like, I, I, my, I'm I notorious for reading rules too fast and not, like, actually absorbing them. So I'm like, oh, I get to pick a point at 11 inches, and then, bam, that's where it goes. But then, like, after reading it and slower and, and making – because I was like, why do I care that the 4-inch AoE or the 4 on the AoE thing is pointing backwards? And then I realized that I had just went over the deviation or roll deviation section there. Grim can just have so many rules. So like, again, for the 50 millionth time, I just need to play this list more. So we end up picking a spot by the uh, Eradicator over there, hoping that I can maybe get some damage on on off of feet turn. And they haven't done their little arms up thing yet. So maybe at dice off three, I can get some stuff going. Uh, I end up deviating way off of anything that matters. So that's unfortunate. So now Gatsby can fly up there. He's got melee range to five dudes. And I'm like, I'm slanting him slightly. So that way he can see that Nacelayer I missed. Uh, but I have a couple burner bots that are going to go up to and try and get him. So the rest just fly. Burner bots go. First one misses. Second one in the butt hits, auto points it, Gatsby's on, got a soul. And I get a corpse finally. Yep. So Gatsby goes, punches a dude, gets a soul. Buys an attack, punches a dude, gets a soul. Buys an attack, punches a dude. You make me reroll it, get a soul. Punch a dude, get a soul. So Gatsby is now sitting on two focus and five souls, so he's going to be ten focus next turn which is super fun for me. It's also like not good for me at all because I'm really running out of stuff down there to take care of things. So like Gatsby's starting to really threaten anything that I have over there. Like maybe getting into that cage rager, he just like one rounds it and then can flicker out and charge the Prime Axiom at Old Witch. Uh, so now Lucant goes, he runs away because I realize at this point, I feel like Brian's only out his assassination. I'm starting to run low on clock. I ran the arc node through, so I positive charge the Prime Axiom and the uh, scavenger scavenger that way when the eradicators go up they'll be mat 11 with their plus two ability and now here i'm realizing the corollary to keep it within three inches of uh lucant uh, it's gonna have to walk uh straight forward and it activated after lucant so i didn't get to the second focus so it power transfers up so the prime axiom is only sitting on two unfortunately but I still think it can power through at POW 23, thanks to the positive charge. Yeah, it's like dice plus four against this Cage Rager. But I am in range of one Malady Man, or Grave Ghoul. Grave Ghoul, yep. You ended by the one that's behind that rock on the bottom, who is sitting on a fat stack of corpse. So at dice plus four, the first one I believe I rolled a four. Now I rolled a five. This one does decent. You make me re-roll it. Yep, and that, that hurts a little less. And I, I could have chosen to re-roll the... Uh, the the hit rolls just to see if you get it, but you only need a three to hit him or a four to hit him. I so need a I need a two with uh yeah with positive charge and so I have like, sustained attack on the fist. So as long as I hit one of them, <clears throat> yeah, it was like I needed to fish have you fish for double ones or something. And that I, I was more more interested in just like seeing if I could spike the damage rolls lower to make you spend more to do it. So here we're measuring the C if I would take a free strike because I really want to get a couple on the the pony UA, but. I'm not doing shields up this turn. I'm doing the plus two just to try and get around the Grave Ghoul and then to make sure that I'm hitting the... Because if I hit, I auto-kill the little Nace Slayers, and I really want to clear this zone, so I opt to take the free strike because uh, it's dice minus... It was pound nine, so you'd be... Dice minus six on the mount. Yep, there was a chance that I could, could kill an Eradicator on a free strike, but it was really unlikely. So there I punch the Grave Ghoul, I want to say. First attack misses, second one kills it sidesteps forward or no the first one did hit the charge killed it sidesteps forward onto the the pony the second swing damages at the proc finisher and now a mat 11 charge just puts him down so now i've cleared that bottom zone i've cleared the middle zone and so i already scored one last turn so i'm going to be scoring three to his zero as long as i can test and here i'm doing a couple uh, charges i get two charges on the clock one on a nayslayer uh, the first one on the clock, unfortunately, cripples a system. Yep. And or I you think make I, me made, I made you re-roll it because I was looking for you to spike a little lower maybe. And you do about the same. So it does allow me to time stutter the three inches away so I can stop you from doing the sidestep garbage. 
and then the rest are going through and just uh, beating on little horses. Yep, because unfortunately eradicators are only half inch melee, so even being base to base, he stutters three inches, I walk two, so he's still out. Uh, so they are just sidestep around to kill a couple ponies, just to be more annoying. And they also did the plus two the hit, because I'd hope to get more on the clock, but that's not how it works with clocks. So now I've got to figure out how to deal with this Prime Axiom that's staring down Old Witch. I don't have, I have like a couple Madcaps and the Twilight Sisters on the bottom that can maybe contest that bottom zone, but they're not going to survive long enough to make sure that the, that that zone can't be cleared easily. So I decide to take my time to start uh, working on clearing the top zone. I feel like I can, if I can try and, I don't have a ton of time left. Like I think after all the deviation garbage with that Madcap boss, I'm down to like five minutes. Yep. So, uh... I try to take care of the things that are most important first. And if I clear the zone, I can try and like bring the scoring back a little bit my way. And then maybe if I can do it quickly enough, I might have enough time to try and unpack like a, a late game assassination on Lucant or something. And the eradicators, they aren't too difficult to get rid of now that they're not feeded on anymore. So I get rid of the, the uh, servitor right away. And then after that, I start uh, taking some attacks with uh, the madcap uh, grunts throwing bombs, and each one of them uh, connects and take out another eradicator, so that was nice. Uh, next up, I think we're doing the, the grave ghoul. He's just taking normal swings into the eradicator in front of him, but doesn't come up with anything. And then Eilish decides to bleed shot him with uh, mental force and ends up doing enough damage to take him off the table, uh, but he ends up killing himself in the process. Uh, because I don't get to heal off of the uh, eradicators. He does not like oil. He wants that blood. So next up, I charge my warhorse into the eradicator on the top zone, and I do not... This is do... the mount attack. Yeah, that was, the, that was the impact attack. And then I end up uh, taking him off with the charge. And then uh, I believe this is... Uh, the next thing I want to try and line up is uh, figuring out what to do with Old Witch. And... Uh, uh, I don't know what I just put behind her, but something happened with her. At this point, I think you're realizing you're sub two minutes. Yeah. So you decide just to charge. Oh, yeah. This axiom. was my YOLO moment where I said, let's just put some damage in the Prime Axiom and see what happens. So she's PAL 15. I've got Curse of Shadows on him still because I didn't upkeep it, but Ethan was kind enough to let me keep it there. Uh, I end up uh, hitting and doing a ton of damage on the chart. Well, not a ton, but enough for a POW 15 caster into an arm 19 colossal. 20, arm 20. 20. 20, sorry. Uh, so I start buying attacks, and I decide to boost the damage rolls. It's dice off three, so I probably could have done, like, I, I feel like I just wanted the spikes here and see if I could get some, you know, special upsets or something. And uh, I think... Uh, we end up taking out one side of the Prime Axiom, which is pretty cool, but uh, it doesn't matter for much of anything because right about now is when I end up running the clock on myself. Yep, you clock so, on that last attack. Yep, so I, I get to finish out the damage roll because I think I clocked while I was doing it. So I got to at least get the side down before my time ran out. My next thoughts, my next plan was to like have the clock of trice take out the diffuser and then position better for getting around to Luc Lucant. Um but then uh, after that, it would just be contesting the bottom zone, and then Ethan would just need to clear that middle zone and maybe contest my circle zone, which I think it might be hard. You might just be able to pop a servitor and then go get it. Yeah, that was going to be my plan. Just literally every turn, poop a servitor, it runs your zone, which would only take me one or two more turns to outscore you. Yeah, and with the I even even if I didn't like. If the if the time were somehow better managed for me, I still feel like it was. The, the way that I do damage in this list is just really difficult for me to um, be effective on your feet turn. So probably would have been better for me is to find a way to stay out of your threat ranges and just let you time walk me. And maybe if I do something like give up three points or four points on that turn, it at least means that um, you needed to get into the zones. Maybe, contest, maybe I can test with something inconsequential like cast gimps or something. Um, and then try and slow roll the, the engagement for the game that way. But given the way that I do damage again with the armor piercing and stuff like that, it was just a little bit more difficult for me to kind of punch up into Lucant's stuff here. And plus, like, 
I kind of, if you kind of paid attention to how I was deploying and maneuvering things, I was kind of fighting this game in this like three front style where like one half of my army was in the circle zone and half of my army was in the other circle zone. And that really left nothing in the middle because if, if the cage rager were to maybe, I kind of positioned the cage rager way off on the side because I was like, oh, I'll get to take advantage of the arc node and then realize you only have like one corpse in the whole list yep and i deployed it on the opposite side of the board away from the cage rager yep, for that so, very reason so i should have probably put the cage rager in the middle knowing that that would be the thing that would need to go into the prime axiom to try and get some damage there uh so it was just uh some unfortunate stuff on my part and i, I will maintain again i think it's like the fourth time i've said it I really need to play this list more because it's just got so many layers to it that if you're a person like myself who rotates through all these factions, there are just some lists where you really need to spend the time with it to learn the intricacies of it. And this Grimkin list is definitely one of those. Maybe if I were like 10 more games deep into this one, this game wouldn't have been as bad for me because most of my time was spent taking up my clock with things that didn't matter. Yeah. And like on the flip side, I haven't played Lucant since pre-Oblivion, but He's Lucant. Like, it's really easy to play Lucant. Like, there's a couple, like, cute, like, positive charge tricks, shield guarding, watcher moves, but, like, I'm playing Lucant with a prime axiom and two units. Like, I just feed, decel, and that's my game plan. Whereas you, you're a lot more technical. Yeah. Like, I got to do some fancy stuff with eradicators, with, like, their abilities. And here's going to be my rant. I forgot to do it when we did the thing. I really, really wanted them to fix stupid variable weapons in the SID, and they didn't because they last for a round, not until their next activation. So I did the plus two to hit one turn. It comes around. my Now it's the new round. They no longer get plus two to hit for their vengeance swings. Same with reciprocators. They do plus two to damage rolls. Their vengeance comes around. They don't get their variable weapons. It's just like... Why isn't it until next activation? That's all I wanted out of the SID for them. And they just got point reductions instead, which are also still really, really good. And a few other rules, like finisher on them is pretty bananas and nice. Yeah, the the, the medium-based infantry and convergence, I feel like every single option has a, a reason to be included. Like, personally, I own two units of each, and I don't feel any regret about that because I just feel like... No matter what, you can play double perforators, you can play double eradicators or double uh, reciprocators, and it, it is good no matter what. Like even in this Lucant list, like when I first, I think it was, I played against one of the Madison newer players uh, recent, recently in the before times, and uh, I was looking at the eradicators for his list, and I was like, these are half-inch melee sidestep troops. Like these are such a joke, but they do a lot of work. Yeah, now with finisher and like it's back to gaspy too gaspy just makes them so God, good i still gaspy's just a little too i mean he didn't do a lot of influence in this game but even just the threat of him and what he like i honestly feel like what happens in this next turn here is like if you don't use the prime axiom to kill old witch you can you you were or that turn where the the cage rager was like in the way or whatever you still probably could have like gotten gaspy onto old witch and just rocked her i mean he didn't have souls uh and there, he didn't have the distance. He could have maybe flickered and charged, but then with three, four attacks, yeah, with focus, like he wouldn't have killed her. He well, would kill her this turn with ten focus. I can't remember like flicker. I hate the changes they did to this with Warcaster units, but you need to, yeah, you need to be able to see. So if you see Old Witch, you can flicker and then charge her. But yep, if you don't, yeah, I just that flicker thing is so obnoxiously dumb. I'm like I'm fine with it honestly. Like I think we talked about it a little bit. If you don't know about the flicker nerf, uh, I hid Gatsby behind the Burning Earth a turn before, and uh, in pre, a ruling he could flicker into the cloud and then charge. But since units receive their order at the beginning of their activation, he needs a legal charge target before he flickers. So he has to be able to see what he wants to charge. Otherwise, he has to, he can't run anymore because he's already cast a spell. So he has to sack his action and walk. I believe that's the final ruling without it like in front of me. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what the what the final resolution on it was, but I think the the big thing for me is just like. Warcaster units are already a slight detriment. Like, I know that you could argue it back and forth that they're actually beneficial or something, but um, I feel like they have, they're just a little bit under that midpoint of uh, being like not good, but like there are some things that affect them in ways that are negative. And the flicker thing or the energizer thing is definitely a cool trick that a lot of them had. And now that they don't have this, 
it's like uh it it, it takes the existing rules right and kind of just like clarifies it in a negative way for them i feel like they probably could have done this differently to let them keep this cool trick that made them a little bit more unique or at least let them do what they would do if they did weren't married to like a bunch of servitors or a couple dogs and uh and still have this like neat thing for them but now i just i guess i just if if there's a hill i die on actually you can't die on hills anymore in war machine uh unless you bring uh gristle too or yep. no not gristle uh janessa or uh, siege too siege two. well no he makes a foxhole he makes the raise thing. oh siege two. yeah siege he two. makes the raise thing so that you can only uh, the hill i will die on when I bring Janessa, is that the flicker energizer thing for units is stupid. See, I'm on the other spectrum, and I completely disagree with you. I think you're biased because you played Butcher 3 for so many years. Whatever. you. So you can shut your you, mouth. Don't you dare claim my bias. I will claim your bias because you played the <laughs> shit out of Butcher 3. Like, It just means they can't be 100% safe. It literally affects two casters, Butcher 3 and Gatsby. Gatsby doesn't need to be better. But any, and other, Butcher, any other Energizer caster or Velocity caster can do that. Cool. And because I have a they unit... They don't come because, with units. <laughs> like It's not that big of a deal. Okay, then get rid of Butcher's dog so he doesn't get Vengeance or Boundless... Or not Boundless, but a Relentless Charge. How about that? Then get you rid of Gatsby's Servitor so he doesn't get free souls. I and, guess I don't care about Relentless Charge because I'm taking Sorcia 2 all the time anyway. Sorcia 0. Sorcia 0, sorry. That's your fault. Like... No. The, I still say there are some units that could use some work, but overall, like there are benefits of being a unit. Like you get the free contest bots, you get stuff like usually they bring granted rules to the unit. Yes, like rebuke really fucks your day, but like that is the downside of being a unit. I'm. I think we're just gonna have to agree to disagree on this one because I think that that change is so god awful stupid, in which will not affect you pretty much ever. Because you don't play Butcher 3 lately, and Gatsby 4 does not need to be better. Like, he needs nerfs more than this, and I just played a game where, like, he did almost nothing but kill single wound infantry that he just needed six as the hit. Yeah, he had the potential to really do some damage on that bottom side, but the rest of the army just did stuff on that. Well, that's his problem. Like, he has the tankiness of a caster, like, and literally on my next turn, if you just contest, you move over... I have a 10 focus gas speed. Yeah, like no matter what I put in the zone, the it's dead. What the fuck are you going to do to that? Like, <laughs> even if I don't take attacks, I'm just like, okay, I'm armor 17 with 10 focus. What kills me? Yeah, short of old witch unpacking into you with full focus and curse of shadows on you, I don't think there's anything. Even then, like, she has to boost. Yeah, she could probably do it with boost damage, but she has to curse. Then she has to hit me, and, like, her curse could miss. Yeah, exactly. You're, like, 14. Fuck yeah, I am. He's yeah. 14, 17. He has better stats than some of the casters I play. His stats are actually... I'm pulling up Warham now. I think he they, has the same stats as Lucant. No, Lucant. Yep, 14, 17. Lucant, my caster, is 14, 17, and he just has six extra boxes because I want to say Gatsby has. No, Gatsby has 17 fucking boxes, and Lucant has 21. Yeah. I am bringing the stats of my caster with more versatility, speed, and a unit for contest bots that collect him souls. So, the man, his unit's really good. Thank God he's a unit. Whatever. We're, we're done. <laughs> this conversation is over.